everybody. Welcome. Make sure I got my screen all figured out here. Uh, I hope this is working. I just clicked uh, start streaming, so uh, I, I think I'll get a message to let me know that it's actually working here in a second. I hope it is. Um, my name is Jim Hodgson. Thank you so much for joining me today. We're going to do a little bit of, uh, we're going to have a little bit of chat about uh, uh, how to be funny. Now, I just want to start, um, let me make sure this is, appears to be streaming. Yeah, it looks good. So I just want to start by saying um, that this is for you. If, if you want to be funny, you can be. Um, for, for some reason, a, a lot of people in comedy, uh, they like to say, you know, you're either born funny or you're not. Uh, they say stuff like, uh, you can't teach comedy. And I try to argue with those people just to, to, to sort of figure out why they say that. And they don't really have any good answers. I mean, it, it usually boils down to they'll just say something like, you know, you just you just can't learn. You can't teach funny. I mean, you can teach all the things, but that just please understand that anybody can learn to do this. It's not magic. <laughs> it's 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 great. I love it. It's it's a huge part of my life. But it, it's for anyone. It's for anybody that wants to do that. So, um, OK, a little bit about me. So so ignore if anybody ever says to you, you know, you're either born funny or you're not. You can't teach funny. Ignore that. You can learn how to do this. If I can do this, believe me, you're going to be fine. So who who am I? I'm Jim Hodgson. I'm the director of uh, the Scene Shop. We're an online uh, comedy writing community. We produce some funny stuff, like um, an audio drama called Bad Gladiator. It's a little bit like uh, you know, like a Futurama style thing, um, set in Roman times. Uh, podcast. So if you want to listen to that, badgladiator.com. You can find out more about the rest of us at uh, sceneshop.us. Uh, we have some paid and unpaid uh, writing opportunities for anybody who's interested in doing that. I teach sketch writing here in my hometown of Atlanta, Georgia at the, uh, the Village Theater. Excuse me, I just forgot the name of the theater. Um, I'm the author of, you know, a dozen fiction novels, uh, nonfiction as well. And, uh, I started working on building a comedy writing community, and it, it's. Oh, I also moderate the R Comedy Writing subreddit, and that's that's from almost ten years ago. And when I started, there just wasn't a lot of information on on how to go from sort of, you know, zero to uh, your first couple of years in comedy writing. So that's why I started this. Just um, I, I just want to get other, get other funny people together, and and try to help one another. You know, learn how to be better at this. So I've also got a book called The Way of the Laugh, and that's why I titled this book The Way of the Laugh. You guys can find a link to that at uh, sceneshop.us if you want to download the book. It's free. Um, let's see. Yeah. This is I'm I'm this is the first time I've ever done uh, like a slideshow uh, webinar streaming thing, and I didn't know how to look at my notes and be able to look at these slides, so I printed them out. Um, and if you didn't already think that I'm a thousand years old. I'm I'm printing out your slides years old. So feel free to mock. All right. So here's some things that we're going to cover. Um and all of this is to to get us closer to making to making comedy more easily reproducible. We want it to be something that we can if not well, we're not going to succeed every time, but we want to be able to make it easier to do and, and uh, uh, we want to be able to get a little bit faster at it and take out some of the guesswork now it, you're never going to have you're never going to be hitting home runs every time it just doesn't it just doesn't work which is part of why it's so enjoyable but um yeah okay so quick questions uh, this is the kind of stuff that I want to cover excuse me why is it so much easier to make friends laugh etc I don't want to read the slides out to you because it Whenever I see people give a presentation and they just read the slides, that drives me insane. So let's dive right in, shall we? Oh, um, also I'm going to check for questions here. None yet. So I'm getting questions on uh, Discord. Oh, I should say we also have a Discord. So if you're ever if you ever writing anything, uh, you can find us on our Discord. And um, if you have any questions after this is over, anything like that, feel free to come on by. We're always happy to help. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me, I just sniffed right on the mic. Why is it so much easier to make my friends laugh? The simple answer is because they care about you. 
they care what happens to you and they they know they they have some backstory on you so they you have you have some built-in relatability friends and family you know um it just gets much harder when you're trying to make strangers laugh because they don't have that relatability so you could say to them uh you know yesterday i was walking down the street and a man said to me this is the setup of a joke if you say that to your friend your friend is like is is probably going to be at least a little bit interested to hear what's what happened to you. You were walking down the street and somebody spoke to you. That's that seems weird. But if a stranger says that to you, you're like, you know, nothing. Um, now nobody knows what humor is really. Um, there, are, it, there are people do try to study it, but nobody has a nobody has a concrete formula. But the best explanation that I've come up with and and sort of I think about this all the time but I describe it as the release of tension so we want to build tension and then release it and we want to release it in there are a couple of, of things that we want to do when we release that tension you know we want it to be relatively quick we'd like for it to be clever you know surprising that kind of thing so that's the way that I approach uh, uh, teaching comedy we want to build some tension then we want to release it. Um, the thing about building tension, like I said, making friends laugh, they care about what's happening to you. People won't laugh at stuff that they don't care about. So, you know, on the one hand, it's on the one hand, approaching comedy from this way is it means that if, if you say something and somebody laughs, that's, that's your moment forever. You made that person laugh. But you know what what you hear a lot of on the internet is this isn't funny or that isn't funny but if somebody is saying things and people are laughing then it's funny. It's like you know I use this uh, I I use the comparison to strength all the time. If if you go to the gym and you pick up the weight then you picked it up. There's no <laughs> that's but you know somebody on the internet will be like oh he's not strong or she's not strong or whatever but if you go to the, if you went there and you picked the thing up that, that's it. That's it. So it's the same with funny. If So if you're watching something on TV and people are laughing, even if you're not laughing, you can't say it's not funny. It's laughs are happening. So it's it's a it's an equalizer in that way. So but people won't laugh about stuff that they don't care about. I kind of skipped ahead. Why don't people always laugh at stuff, laugh at stuff that I find hilarious? You know, different life experiences Different things make different people tense. So if somebody starts telling you the setup of a joke and it just doesn't do anything for you at all, then you're not going to laugh. You're not going to laugh when the tension gets released because it's just, it's not interesting to you. So we want to create tension in a clever way and then release it. Um, and it's all about knowing how to create that feeling of tension without going too far. I mean, you know, if you pointed a knife at somebody, that would create tension for them, but it would be a little much. It wouldn't really be a joke. That's why, you know, that's why when people say something that, that crosses the line and other people get upset, they like to say, oh, it's a joke, it's a joke, it's a joke. But a joke is when you don't <laughs> go too far. So it's a little bit about reading the room. So, uh, But yeah, there is no objective funny. There's no like... And what I mean by that is there's, there's nothing is going to be funny to everybody. So it just doesn't work that way. So what that means is anybody can learn to do it, but it also means that you can't go around saying X, Y, or Z person isn't funny because if they get laughs, then they're funny. How do I know if what I'm doing will be funny? You can't. The only thing that you can do is try. Um, Practice really helps, though. I mean, um, you, you get a comic would call it reading the room. So you 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 just understand the, sort of the ingredients of the environment that you're in, and you know how to kind of ride that line. And the only way to have that, the only way to know that is experience. Again, it's not something you're born with. It's just that some people learn how to do it a little bit earlier in life. Um, like for example, uh, if you're an orphan, uh, 
then, and you know that you don't have any blood family, then you might, you might learn how to be funnier a little bit earlier than life than other people, because you notice that making people laugh makes them pay attention to you and you want that, you know? And it also, you know, so it's like, you know, people say that you have to have, you have to be in a, you have to have been in traumatic experiences or have a bad childhood so to, in order to be funny. And, you know, it helps. It does help, but it also hurts in a lot of other ways. So <laughs> maybe don't, maybe don't wish for that. Also, in my opinion, in order to really be funny, you kind of have to care about people because in order to, in order to understand them well enough to sort of reach, uh, uh, I mean, you're kind of telling the future because you're, you're, you're not, you don't just know what's going to create tension for them, but you kind of know how they're going to react when you, when you say the punchline. So you, you kind of have to care about people a little bit. I, I don't think that, I think it's going to be pretty hard to, to, to really be funny if you hate everyone. I mean, I know that there are comedians who that's their persona, but I don't, I don't know that that's the way that they, that they really are in life. So how do I know if what I'm going to do will be funny? You can't, but you can practice, you can gain experience and you can try caring about people. I recommend caring about people anyway, <laughs> uh, but it does help. So some concrete ways to get a little bit funnier, uh, take an improv class or take a stand up class, uh, do stand up. Now, uh, workshopping with other comedy writers. You can do that on our Discord, or uh, I believe you guys have a Discord too. Uh, workshopping with folks. What do you guys think about this? Um, the problem with workshopping on the internet, of course, is that people are going to say, oh, that's not funny. And what they mean is, what they mean is it's not landing for me personally, because there's no such thing as that's not funny. Um, so you have to kind of take that stuff with a grain of salt. Um, but... You know, if you say something to five people and all five of them go, nah, I don't know, it's, uh, then, you know, they, they might be right. But if you say something and they laugh, then they can't say, well, it's not funny. You just you just laughed. I almost said a bad word. I don't know if that's allowed or not. Um, and then lastly, of course, there's just consuming stuff with a critical eye. Um, okay. Just while we're on the slide, I'm going to answer this question. How do you read a room in a YouTube video, though? Uh, you don't. But you do make more than one YouTube video. So if you make a video and all the comments are either nobody comments about something that was funny or uh, people do comment and they say you're a cornball, <laughs> then then maybe that particular one didn't land. But you can you can land it the next time. Um, I think. When I was. My wife and I had a, a YouTube show called Cross Thread, which is why I have all this crap. Um, and I, I, my sense of of making stuff for YouTube now, uh, you guys can tell me, but I, I'm at that time it, there was a big push for everybody to make lots of videos, like lots and lots and lots. So we were part of sort of automotive YouTube, um, uh, alongside you know like the B is for builds and the uh, Mighty Car Mods of the world. Um, so like B is for Bill was making, was, is putting out videos. I think he's still doing it. I just like putting out videos all the time, all the time, all the time. So you might not be able to read the room during a particular video because it's, a uh, you know, you're pushing it out to the world, but you can get a sense, especially if you're true believers, what they think of what you're doing. And, um, I mean, if somebody, especially if somebody's uh, like, they're watching all your videos, uh, they're, they're a good fan. They seem to really get what you're doing you know, feedback from them is pretty valuable. So there's, there's a lot of not valuable feedback from people on the internet. That's not phony. But if, you know, somebody who's in your network and, and really enjoys your show says, ah, you know, I didn't really love the part where you blah, blah, blah. But, you know, at the same time, even as I'm saying that, I, I don't, it's also tough to be interacting with people who are, who are fans and, and uh, enjoy your stuff. And, um, I just, I just always felt like I was chasing them away by being like, okay, what about minute two? Did you like minute two at second three? Or what about minute two at second five? <laughs> you know? So I don't think you want to, you don't want to bore them to that degree probably, but, uh, so no, you're right. You can't do that in the middle of a video, but you can make another video, which I encourage you to do anyway. All right. Excuse me. I'm sniffy all of a sudden. Why do people get offended at jokes? Um, 
this is just a natural hazard of of creating tension. So uh, if you think of it like a, a, a like a, I don't know like any kind of tension, uh, mechanical tension or high pressure. If we're pressurizing something, every now and then we're going to have probably have a problem. Um, you can create seriously funny work by riding that line of acceptable, not acceptable and, and tension stuff. Like I really like Anthony Jeselnik a lot. Um, but if you're going too far to get attention, it's really easy to come off um, as what I would call an edgelord. Somebody is just, just trying to be sort of shocking for the sake of being shocking. So that's, that's the risky run. Um, I think that somebody like Anthony Jeselnik gets away with what, what he gets away with because his stuff has a really high level of craft. You know what I mean? So his, it's the way that he delivers his jokes in a very precise voice. He speaks very slowly and he leaves a lot of space between them. So it's clear that everything he's saying, he means to say it. It's not like he's just, it's not like he's just saying shocking stuff as fast as he can. Uh, so I include this because when new comedy writers come to us, they sometimes will get folks who seem to just be saying shocking things. Um, and it's tough because on the one hand, it there shouldn't be anything that's taboo. And also, if you're writing comedy, it should be okay, especially if you're new, it should be okay to experiment and just try and see what fits for you. But I don't, th I, personally, I don't like, I'm not a big fan of just shocking for the sake of shocking. I'm a big fan of craft. So, um, one other thing though, you have to consider is that people get legitimately considered, uh, they get legitimately offended if you create tension for them that you don't feel yourself. So that's going back to like pulling a knife on somebody. You're you're creating tension, yes, but all the tension is over there. So that's why you see a lot of people use self-deprecating humor. That that's the pendulum swung into in the other direction. Self-deprecating humor is you know creating all the tension over here, like saying you know something about yourself, and then there's going on that way. It's it's you kind of want to be in the middle. And again, that's that's a riding your line thing. That's a that's a uh, practice and experience thing because you don't want to sound like you're you don't want to sound like you're having a depressive episode and you're just talking about how terrible you are all the time you know but uh creating tension all the time that other people feel is called bullying so you don't want to do that either so experience all right slide change kaboom Jokes of the Adams of all, of all humor. This is how I approach uh, comedy writing. So you, you can really think of, of, any, uh, of any humorous moment as a joke. There's some kind of setup. You, you're, you learn about the world, and then something changes, and you see another piece of the universe that kind of connects back to that setup, and that's a joke. So... Personally, my, my big thing is five bad jokes a day. Um, if you can't go to improv class or, or be part of improv and you can't do stand-up, then this can really help. Just every day you write five bad jokes. And I say bad because I don't want people to get, I don't want people to get hung up on trying to write good jokes every day. If you try to do, if you try to write the best joke that was ever written every day, eventually you're gonna give up because you're gonna be like, oh, I don't know these jokes. I just don't. I'm not feeling them. They don't feel that good anymore. Like you, when you start, it feels like exciting, and then maybe a week or two in, it's like, Ugh, this is not. It's not as fun as it used to be. But it's not about fun. It's about it's about practicing the shape, setup, punchline. Uh, there's also tags which are the third part of jokes, but forget about tags. So five bad jokes a day. And it's just, it's just huge to keep your momentum going. And I, I, I really recommend it. Uh, now, if you have improv in your town, I highly recommend that. If you have stand up in your, if you can do stand up where you are, you can't, that I'm more of a stand up guy than an improv guy. 
Um, the thing about stand-up is, especially if you're making work for the internet, if you've gone and done stand-up comedy and, and you get to talk for five minutes, you say whatever you want, usually, most open mics, if you have said or done something in front of a room of strangers and you have heard people laugh, that moment is yours forever. So if somebody in your comments is like, well, you're not funny and this and blah, 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 blah. I heard the laughs. I mean, you, you can say, again, like the gym, I picked, it, I picked up the thing. You can say I'm not strong if you want to, but I was there. I was holding the weight and I picked it up. So highly recommend it. But if you live in a, you know, maybe you're not old enough to go and do stand-up comedy. Uh, maybe they don't have it in your town. Five bad jokes a day. Uh, you can post them in our comedy writing. We'll try to help. Uh, you can come and share them with us on Discord. Anything you want. We're here to help. All right. Slide change. Let's see if there's any questions. Good to go. Let's see. All right. Let's get into it. The shape of a joke. So here, this is the, this is like the ski jump shape that you want out of a joke. Set up. You can see my diagram. I don't know why I'm pointing to the screen. You can't see that. <laughs> Set up and punchline. So we want a lot of tension so that the stakes are high. Um, oftentimes when people start doing their five bad jokes a day, their jokes will be a, a, like a paragraph. There'll be a there'll be a lukewarm sort of a paragraph, which is fine, again, because it's meant to be a bad joke and it's it's a motivation and accountability thing. But when you start turning those into real jokes, you want it to be like laser focus. No, you want every superfluous word has to be gone. You want only the only the syllables that you need. And something I think that you'll notice when you start when you look at your favorite stand up com comedians what you'll notice is sometimes they don't even really speak in sentences. And that's because they've, they're have they using, they're, they're getting to a point of word economy where they've just decided that if I say the sentence the way that I would type it out, that's too many words. It's too many syllables. I can cut some of these syllables and people will still understand what I mean because, you know, when you're speaking to your friends on the street or wherever, you don't necessarily use every necessary syllable. You know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Hear me? Do you know what I mean? That's the whole sentence. You know what I mean? You get me. So we want the setup to be as short as possible. Brevity is the soul of wit, Shakespeare said. Of course, yeah. Polonius was speaking to Hamlet's mother, Gertrude. And that quote is meant to say... I'm going to tell it like it is. Your son is insane. But also true about jokes. We want to keep them short. Let's see if there are any questions on the question line. Good. Um, another Something else that you'll notice on the internet is you'll see a lot of jokes that are all wit. Um, think of a dad joke. That's, that's wit. Uh, puns, cleverness. You know, I think that we all like that stuff. Um, I do, but that's not, that's, that's, it's not really funny. It's like wit, think of wit like a spice. Yeah, good. Good to add spice, but you can't eat spice or you shouldn't. I mean, you can, <laughs> I don't recommend it. Uh, dad, John's pun, dad jokes, puns, wordplay. They all do, they all do pretty well on the internet. So like, like if you, if you post, if you're writing your five bad jokes a day, and they're all like witty jokes, and you put them on our comedy writing, honestly, they're going to get upvotes because because Reddit likes that stuff. But if you go to a stand-up, if you go to an open mic and you say all that witty stuff, it's eh, you're going to get some lukewarmish kind of laughs, but you're not going to get you're not going to get real engagement. Because it's better to be telling a story that people can understand that, that and they can relate to you and they you know, that kind of stuff. So should I talk about tags? I have notes here that I want to. Yeah. So, stand-up comics use... A, a tag is something that you say after the joke, when it landed, 
in order to keep people in the moment. So if you, it, it's like a, it's like a second punch. Like if you throw a punch at somebody and it really lands and you hit them hard and they stagger, then you throw another one and you hit them again. So, uh, like you'll hear when you're in conversation with somebody, you'll hear somebody like they'll say something funny and they'll hear you laugh and then they'll go. And I was like, because they're they're continuing the joke. Sometimes um, like um, if you're listening to an old idiot <laughs> talk and say something funny, sometimes people will say something funny and they'll get a laugh and then they'll repeat the punchline. Because they're having that, they're 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 sensing that there's a way to keep this laughing moment going longer by saying more things, but they don't have a tag from what they, so they just repeat the punchline. They're using that as a tag. So that's why I say don't worry about tags and don't write tags because it's just not necessary unless your jokes are landing. If your jokes if your jokes are landing, if you're doing stand up, your jokes are landing. Write tags. All right, what do we got here? Since a video is like a Reddit post, should I use more wit in my video? No, because I think the difference is, I mean, look, you know your audience and you know your work, but it works better on Reddit because Reddit is written. Um, so I haven't seen your videos. I don't know what they are. But, and people will laugh. People will laugh. Um, but I think you want to stick with jokes about, you know, about you, about life. Uh, stuff that comes from things that upset you, things that you love, uh, things that your community is upset by, things that your community loves. Because there's just more a, a, a sort of reward of relatability there, uh, in my opinion. If you say something witty, it's like, okay, you found a little witty corner and you showed it to people. Cool. I mean, it's like, I don't know. Yeah, you should if you want to, but... I don't think that you're going to have that same sort of community building uh, aspect as you would if you said something that was that truly angered you or truly made you feel joyful or, you know, uh, so forth like that. It is it, it's I don't know. It's a little bit easy. It's, it's like a it's like a trick. It's like a party trick. Nothing wrong with party tricks, but uh, it's not the meat. What do we got here? Just repeating the punch. Forget about tags for now. Uh, callbacks. So a callback is when you guys all know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. A callback is when you made a jerk, a joke earlier or something funny happened earlier and you reference that later on in the piece. So if you're making a 10 minute video and you make a joke at the beginning about something, you can, you can sort you can repeat that joke again and again, if it seems like it's good or if it seems like it works. Um, I, I think, so this is how people end up with catchphrases. I don't think it's a good idea to force to try to force having a catchphrase in your in your audience, but your your commenters and your people in your community will notice that there are certain little things that you say and do, and they'll repeat them to you. And then, I mean, if it's landing with folks, I don't see any reason why not to 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 call back to it. You don't want to overdo it and anything like that, but you you have little ticks that you do because we all do, and your audience is going to notice them. And they'll kind of rib you about them a little bit, and you can enhance and, and and play with that. But callbacks are also good. I mean, if you you know if you do something and people dig it, do it again. <laughs> All right, let's see. Can I give some examples of jokes? I can, but here's some advice. So, let's say that if you start doing stand up comedy. The first thing that that your friends and family are going to say to you when you start doing that is they're going to say, oh, really? You're doing stand-up comedy? Tell me your funniest joke. And because you're new to stand-up comedy, you're going to say, okay, here's my funniest joke. And you're going to tell it. And it's going to do nothing. <laughs> because tell me your funniest joke and then cross arms is the worst uh, it is the worst setup that your humor could your humor could possibly have. When somebody says, tell me your funniest joke, it's like them saying, okay, funny man, let's see what kind of funny you can do. It's just, it's just a terrible environment for comedy. So can I give you examples of jokes? Yes, and I will, but not mine. <laughs> uh, let me make sure I answered that. 
provide examples of what he's talking about rather than just describing the concept. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Don't you worry. Are tags like when you make a joke and then make a reference it again five minutes later to make them laugh again? Yeah, I would call that a callback. No, a tag is when... Um, let me think of a tag. Um, let's see. Um, so... Uh, I just said that I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to anyway. So I've been hitting, lately I've been hitting libertarians pretty hard in my stand-up material. Um, and uh, mostly because I'm making a joke about, about my younger self. So the joke goes, um, I, uh, personally I vote libertarian, but I also go to swingers parties, take off all my clothes and screw the couch. People usually laugh at that because they understand what I'm saying is that to be libertarian oftentimes means you're determined to make a third choice in order to make a, a political point. But that political point is not really useful right now because a lot of terrible things are happening. <laughs> I don't know how many Americans or, or uh, uh, UK folks or whatever we got like that. So that usually gets a laugh. And then I say, I'm just trying to make a really important point here, Karen. So that's a tag where people imagine me having sex at a swingers party with a couch. Um, it's just, it's just, it, you're just, like I say, you're just prolonging the moment. So it's not the setup because they're already set up. You already told them the setup. Um, the setup of that joke is um, I vote libertarian. And it's not the punchline because you already said the punchline. It's, it's like another extra punchline that, that rides on the first setup. So you don't have to set them up again. Um, so that's why I say forget about tags because you just don't, you just don't need them. They're, they're good live, but you just don't need them. All right, let's see. So tags are more additions to the joke after the punchline lands. Yes. Yeah, it's, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's like uh, if, you imagine your, if you imagine the setup like a ramp and your the punchline to be like, or excuse me, if you look at the thing that's on the screen already, I apologize. If you imagine the setup is going down this hill and then the punchline is there is the part that throws you into the air. And then you start to come down again. A tag would be like a, I don't know, a trampoline or a, a, a like a, a jet pack or something like that, that, that would keep you in the air a little bit longer before, before we have to go on to the next joke. Speaking of going on to the next joke, Let's look at some jokes. So yeah, like I said, I'm going to give you some examples. Ugh, I need to get a little coffee in. Okay, here we go. So these are uh, these are jokes, and we're going to get to how to apply all this stuff to YouTube. Don't you worry. So this is a Sarah Silverman joke. I can't wait to Sunday. I'm going to see my favorite niece and my other niece. Classic, classic joke shape here. The setup, I can't wait till Sunday. I'm going to see my favorite niece, punchline, and my other niece. So we learned something about the first part. We learned something about the setup, which she left out. And you can also hear in this one, there's just this, there's this perfect break moment in this series of words where it just makes sense to put a pause. I can't wait till Sunday. I'm going to see my favorite niece and my other niece. That's, a, that's, that's, I use this joke because it perfectly shows where the, the delineation between setup and punch. All right, here we go. This is another one. Whenever I meet a pretty girl, the first thing I look for is intelligence because if she doesn't have that, then she's mine. This is an Anthony, Jes Anthony Jeselnik joke. I'm a big fan. I use his, his work a lot, um, uh, because he's a one-liner comedian. So his jokes have setup punchline. I mean, there, it's just, textbook stuff. So if you look at a comedian, I also really like uh, Mulaney uh, and um, uh, Mike Berbiglia. The thing about those those other other comics is it's a little bit harder to tease out the setup and punchline of stuff that they're saying. They're still in there. They're, and if and the more that you you look at a comedy as being setup, punchline, and tag, the more you can tease apart that material. But something that people say when they get started, when we hear from you know new comedy writers, 
is they'll write a, a sort of a lukewarm paragraph. They'll write a paragraph on one funny idea and it's got some funny stuff in it. I mean, they, they like they, they, they're headed in the right direction, but it's all, it's too long. It's a little bit too watered down. And you'll say, you know, uh, I think you're going in the right. I think you're going the right direction. I like what you're trying to do, but I think you should really focus a lot. You should write just a setup and a punchline, so that you you really express that idea in its smallest form. And what they'll say is, "Well, I'm going for a more conversational style." There's no there's no such thing as conversational style. When you get to when you get to the level of the famous comedians that we all know and love, just about everything they say is in setup punchline and tags. There's, there's just no reason to say anything else. You're not, if somebody hired you to build a wall, you're not going to, you know, put pieces of cheese in there. You don't need the cheese. Let's just have the wall. Let's see. Let me check my, um, I feel like irony slash satire is the big trend, right? For comedy right now on YouTube. Um, that may be true. Um, One of the things about uh, satirizing other people's work is some of the work of relatability is done for you. So if you're making a, a wholly new piece of comedy, then it's it, it, you have to do all the work of creating the relatability between you and your audience. But if you're making a piece of work that makes fun of something that people already know, then a lot of that relatability stuff is done for you, you know? Um, like there was just a video on the top of Reddit the other day that was like, it was like Reddit explained or whatever. Um, it's pretty funny, but I mean, would I have watched one of that guy's videos had it not been about something that I sort of know and am annoyed by often, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I don't, I don't think irony or satire are ever going away because, because people watch People watch stuff, especially when it's when it's popular. They 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 consume material and they go, and they wish they could talk back to the people who made that. And that's that's part of what irony and satire are. Let me see. Okay, so the thing. Just getting back to this Jeselnik joke. The thing about this joke is when you hear him perform it, sometimes he'll say, he'll go, "Whenever I meet a pretty girl, whenever I meet a pretty girl." The first thing I look for is intelligence. So he says that first part of the setup twice. He he like sets it up twice, which I think is is really interesting because if she doesn't have that, then she's mine. So again, going back to the shape of the joke, you can feel how we're going in one direction. And then if she doesn't have that, the expected thing for him to say would be, then I'm not interested. Whenever I meet a pretty girl, the first thing I look for is intelligence because if she doesn't have that, then I wouldn't be interested. But that's not a joke. <laughs> okay. I think we get it. Not to belabor the point. Where are we going? Here we go. Rodney Dangerfield. When I was a kid, my parents moved around a lot, but I always found them. Just, I mean, uh, um, if you think of these jokes like like little poems, that it's just, they're just so delicious. <laughs> Uh, that's mixing metaphors, I know, but when I was a kid, my parents moved around a lot, but I always found them. So we, we learned something about the setup. That's that that's what makes a good punchline. We we learned something. And it wasn't just if this were just a witty thing, then the only thing we would have learned was that there was some little tweak of wordplay in the setup. But instead, what we learned is that Rodney's parents were trying to leave him. That's that's the difference between wit and funny. To me. All right. Here's where we're starting to bring it around to YouTube, folks. Let me see. We're doing it on the question line. So the setup and the punchline of, do of the joke, they don't have to be words. You know, if you think about funny moments that you've seen in uh, uh, um, movies and stuff, sometimes it's like there's a scene and then somebody says something that's still a setup and a punchline. Or... or Somebody is, says something to you, and then the scene cuts to something that they were just describing, which is the opposite of what they were describing. That's the punchline of that setup. So it's still it's still got this shape, setup and punchline. So, yeah, just looking at my notes. So one of the things that I think that 
you can use to great effect on YouTube is just cutting without saying what think what people think you're going to say. Um, you know, personally, I watch uh, uh, this old Tony uh, YouTuber. He's a machinist. He just makes uh, machining videos. If you don't know what machining is, it's using machines to cut away metal to make like this this metal bit right here. It's probably machined. It's different than cast. When you cast something, you make a mold and you pour molten metal into it, and then it's the shape of the thing. But when you machine something, you take a block of metal and you cut away all the parts that aren't the thing that you want. Um, and that might sound boring if you're not into that kind of thing, but his, he's really funny. I mean, his, his videos are really, really funny. And one of the things that he does is he'll start saying something. He'll start saying something that sounds like it's going to be dirty, but he cuts away before the dirty part. So by doing that, he gets the benefit of, of saying this sort of off-color thing without actually saying the off-color thing. So nobody can, you know, like he keeps it clean, but he's also flirting with the, the ideas of like uh, uh, flirting with the concept of going blue. Going blue is when you say bad words uh, or talk about, you know, sex stuff. So keep this in mind, the setup and punch, setup, punch and tag format as you're watching funny stuff, especially funny stuff that looks like the kind of thing that you would like to make. And the more practice you have doing that, the more I think you'll say to yourself, ah, I kind of, now I'm starting to see how they set this moment up. And then there was the twist and I learned something about this part. And then maybe you can, maybe you can start reproducing that yourself. All right. Mixing levels of relatability. The thing about relatability on YouTube, and uh, I've seen the, uh, the new tubers sort of, um, one of the, it's I, I, there's a sort of a log line that goes around around with the the new tubers thing and it's uh you're either educating or entertaining right well the reason how to videos do so well on YouTube is you don't really need that relatability they're like they're like nonfiction uh, irony or satire so I don't need to know who Eric the car guy is if I'm trying to fix my Acura and he's got a video on fixing an Acura then I'll, I'll probably watch that video because I need to fix my Acura. You know what I'm saying? But if you're just trying to make a straight comedy video, it's just entertainment, then you don't have that same related... You don't, you don't, you're not getting over that barrier of somebody clicking on your video and watching it. Now, if, somebody has, if somebody's come to your video and started to watch it, I think you want to use high relatability jokes. So high relatability, high relatability jokes are stuff that everybody understands. Relationships, uh, a job, friends, school. And then there are jokes about whatever you're making your video about that they'll understand. If you're doing uh, chess videos, chess jokes, you know. But I think you want to use high relatability stuff when you're trying to build your audience because you want people to care about more than just just what you're saying, right? If you're doing how-to videos and people are coming and they're watching the how-to and then they're just going away and you never see them again, what would that mean? That would mean like, uh, it would be like your videos have a ton of views, but you're not seeing your audience grow. Then maybe you want to use some more relatability stuff about yourself so that people connect with you a little more. Because if they're getting... If, if you're just doing information and they're getting the information and then moving on, maybe it's because they're not, they're just not relating to you. I mean, maybe it's because, excuse me, they're just using YouTube as, I don't know, like a reference section, but you want those, you want those high relatability jokes so that people uh, connect with you and they, and they try to understand you as a human being as more than your work, because those are the folks who are going to stay in your network. Your low relatability jokes are like a callback to something that you did five videos ago that somebody who's watching your channel for the first time is not going to get. But that's okay because you're, you're rewarding the people who have stuck with you and who are getting what you're talking about. I mean, you'll use, you'll see a lot of popular media using references to more popular work and referencing their own work 
because people who understand those things, they're like, ah, they, it's so rewarding when you see something that you know in something else, you know, it's like, and also it's kind of signaling to people like, um, you're just letting them know, like, if you like this thing and you're watching me, then we're kind of in the same, but I don't know if both my fingers are on the screen. Uh, we're in the same ballpark. So like you want to just play around with the mix of both. If you're making a video that you're thinking, Okay, this is gonna be this is gonna be one that gets pretty popular, and hopefully it'll it'll sort of be an onboard. Like, hopefully, people who watch this will get into my my uh, network and stay in my community and become subscribers and all that stuff. Maybe you want to be a little bit more relatable. You use a little bit more relatable jokes in that video, so that so that the new people feel like they're kind of getting funneled in. So they watch it and they say, "This, you know, this is cool. I I I learned something, but also maybe I'll watch some of the other videos." And then, you know, if you're making something that you know is going to appeal to folks that are already in your community, you can do those more more focused jokes that are more fun. Uh, let's see. Ideally, you want a good mix. Um, I don't know how many of us are are famous. Probably none. Certainly not me. So it behooves us for that reason to do high relatability jokes. Um, something that you'll notice if you watch if you watch your favorite stand up comic is sometimes they'll do jokes about, um, well, not necessarily about, but, but if, if you watch them, they'll, they'll do some more low relatability jokes. So it's jokes about them, uh, you know, not so much, uh, relationships, my wife and my kids, things like that, but they're at the level where they got a stand up special and you're not. So if you put yourself in the same bucket as somebody who can fill a theater and you're doing the same humor as somebody who can fill a theater, it's kind of like, you know, <laughs> I think you should think of until you yourself are filling theaters, I think you should try to be as relatable as possible. Really helpful. Oh, great. Camera died. Well, that's annoying. Um, well... You guys are just going to have to deal without my face, which is probably, it's probably pleasing anyway. <laughs> okay. I don't need to gesture anymore. That's what I'm hearing. Let's see. Okay. Just really quick. I want to touch on something that's, that's, if you, if you want to like a trick, a hack, if you will, to make something funny. If you're trying to build a funny moment and you're talking about something that's small, paper clips, for example, not just physically small, but but not not important, then if you make a big deal out of it, you can get some laughs that way. If you're talking about something that's really, really big and really, really important, global economics, if you treat it like it's a small thing, then you can get laughs that way. So if you've ever got a moment and you're like, I think I can make something funny here. You can decide whether this is a teeny tiny thing or a gigantic thing and flip it, whichever way you figure it is. So this is the comedy uh, um, philosophy that built Seinfeld, Larry David, all about that stuff. And even if their humor doesn't in particular resonate with you, that, that sort of trick of flipping big and small is huge. Now, you can also... I, I, I touched on this before, but I think it's a good idea to, to start with stuff that just bothers you, whether it, and when I say bother, I mean like, um, it, it, it creates joy. It makes you laugh or it really makes you mad. Um, if, if it bothers you in that way, then there's something, there's definitely something there. But the problem with talking about things that really make you angry is you don't want to be you don't want to preach and, and like, you don't want to give a lecture to people. You want them, you want them on board. So the best way to do that, like if you, if you're just, if you're bothered by something and you really want to talk about it, you should, because it's, it's, if it's bothering you in that way, then there's something there. Just become the thing that you hate. So this is the, this is how irony and satire are coming back. So if there's something that really bothers you and you really, really want to talk about it, but you're worried that you'll be a little bit too preachy, 
then become the thing that you dislike. This is Stephen Colbert uh, on the Colbert Report, uh, Ali G, all of Sasha Baron Cohen's work. It's like if you if you become the thing that you're that you're angry at, then you act in, a, in an emblematic way. People will get it, but you won't be you won't be preaching to them. You won't be bothering them by just giving a sermon. You know what I'm saying? Become what you hate. All right. Q&A time. We already had some questions. I addressed them in the thing. Let's see if there are more. Thoughts on thoughts of swearing on stage in stand-up. Is there a threshold for where it comes becomes too much? Um, the only, I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, but it depends on you, uh, that particular night, who's in the audience, your delivery. You know, this is one of the big problems with um, people videoing stand-up. I was just in New York uh, in that, at the, um, the Comedy Cellar, and uh, they take they put every they, they put everybody's cell phones in a in a little bag before the show starts, so you can't video the comedians. And we saw some of the funniest comedians in the world. But you know, if somebody had said something in one of those moments that could have been videoed and taken out of context, I think that's problematic for comedy overall. So. Personally, I've been working to make my stand-up cleaner and cleaner. Um, just because I, I feel like I feel like if you're getting if you're getting laughs with clean comedy, then you can easy write easily write dirty comedy. But if you're getting laughs from dirty stuff, I don't think that you ever really know for sure whether what you're writing is is just the funniest stuff in the world, or whether you're just being silly. I mean, like, um, but then there's a line. I mean, there, there's a line. So, like, you know, I'm riding with my stepkids in the car one day, and one of them says something about sharks, and uh, the other one says, sharks don't have butts. And uh, that I almost wrecked the car laughing so hard thinking about car, sharks not having butts. <laughs> so I don't really think that's, I think that's a pretty clean joke. Obviously, it came from a child. Um, but you know, if you might have a, if you were at a corporate gig, they might say, they might ask you not to say the word, but I don't know, <laughs> but is there, is it, is it too much? Yeah. It's too much when people are just trying to create tension by, by saying nasty things. Um, it's, it's just, it's still going to be super subjective though. It's not, I can't tell you for sure. Uh, here's the line and never cross it. Um, so well gang, uh, I hope that I hope that we covered a, a lot of stuff that you guys are will, will find uh, helpful. Um, how long do we go here? I don't see that it says. Uh, wow, nearly an hour. Golly, geez. So you can all you can find my work, my books, and uh, plays, and um, all that kind of stuff at my website, jimhodson dot com. Uh. I speak at a lot of conferences and stuff, and so I'm always saying the name of my website, and I then I have to spell it. So I'll say, like, you can always go to my website, J-I-M-H-O-D-G-S-O-N.com. So then I went out and registered readmyeffingbooks.com, the actual word, no dashes. And that's made life a lot easier, because all I have to say that, and people remember. And usually they laugh. Uh, if you need help with any comedy writing, you have any questions, you want to shout at me, you can find a link to our Discord at sceneshop.us. Um, please, you know, the more questions you guys, uh, uh, that's one of the reasons that I do this as like a professional development thing, because the more I think about comedy uh, is, I think is the funnier that I get. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, you know, I feel like you should be funny, make as much funny work as you can try to be around other funny people and try to bring, you know, people along with you. So that's what this is all about. As I said, you can also grab a copy of the book, The Way of the Laugh, sceneshop.us. You can join the Scene Shop mailing list. Like I said, do stand up or improv if you can. Write those five bad jokes a day. Um, and I think that's it, gang. So thanks for joining me. Uh, I hope this was helpful, useful. Any further questions, please feel free. And uh, I guess you're not going to watch the Super Bowl because it's going on right now, I think. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Oh, shit. I wasn't supposed to say Super Bowl, was I? Golly. Well, I really, really screwed that up. Anyway, 
Thanks again. Take care, guys. Good luck. Goodbye.